Okay. Welcome. I'm Marian Ferranti, head of the Delta Word Weaver Swap Group, and today I'm sharing MC responsibilities with Sarah Armstrong of the Storytelling Association of California, as our two groups are co-sponsoring this <clears throat> workshop. We've always needed to be legal and ethical in our presentations when telling a story not of our own writing. But how do I know I need to ask permission to tell a particular story? How would I go about securing permission if I don't know the originator? What credits do I need to reveal on the day of my telling? These and other questions are facing us more and more. We are recording our stories sometimes, but there could be an audience member, an audience member who's recording us even when we didn't give our permission. There you go, no permission for what you devised. Although we can't control them, we can manage ourselves to be ethical and legal when we tell so that there will not be any question even if someone records us unknowingly. This topic is ours today to grapple with. We hope by the end you'll have some guidance as you ponder these questions out of the material that you wanna present. We'll become more knowledgeable and professional about our work in this spoken word art that has existed throughout man's time on earth. Welcome to Do You Have the Right? Our agenda is that we'll have a page, Pim, I'll get her name later, page uh, from Lawyers for the Arts, she'll present. And then we'll have two testimonies from SAC members of our inquiries or erroneous ways of the past. Then save plenty of time for, the, uh, for Paige to field your questions. So our first, uh, no. <laughs> we had two lawyers planned, that's true. But uh, he has a fever today, uh, Paul Menes. So he's unable to come. So we'll, uh, Paige can pull it through for us. She's very good and knowledgeable. I'm going to introduce Paige. So she's a founding partner in Tectonic LLP, a copyright, trademark, and privacy law firm in San Francisco, California. As a litigator, <laughs> Paige represents clients involved in and cop contemplating copyright, trademarks, privacy, consumer protection, and unfair competition lawsuits. As an advisor, Paige also provides preemptive and ongoing advice to individual creators and media companies regarding the production and dissemination of their creative works and products, including copyright and trademark clearances, registration, monitoring, licensing, and enforcement. In her spare time, Paige volunteers taking care of birds, reptiles, amphibians, fish, and other exotic animals at her local SPCA. Therefore, she's exceptional at handling all kinds of unique clients. We turn it over to Paige. Welcome. Thank you very much, Marianne, and thank you everyone for having me. Uh, you did a great job, Marianne, with the word salad that is everything that I do. Uh, essentially, I've been a practicing attorney now for almost 10 years. I've been doing uh, copyright, trademark, and privacy work pretty much ever since I was a law student because those are my areas of interest. I'm very happy to be here today through a connection with California Lawyers for the Arts, which is a nonprofit, and I'll share their information at the end of my slides today. But essentially, they connect attorneys with different creators and try to bridge the gap of knowledge by putting on presentations. Furthermore, if you ever do find yourself in legal trouble, and I mean, you could just call me, or you could go to California Lawyers for the Arts and they have a referral program. So my job here today is to give you the quick and dirty copyright law landscape so that you know why we even worry about this at all and what kind of terms and rules we're working with. And then I'm going to go over some fact versus, versus myth scenarios that I got from conversing with some of your members and some of the questions that they come up when they're thinking about what kind of stories that they can present. 
All right, let's see if we can easily shift over to share screen. I think that I've got it on handle. So you can feel free to just look at my face. I'll try not to read too directly from the slides, but I do know that legalese, ooh, and I just lost a light in my own office, but that's fine. We're just gonna roll with it. My, uh, my lighting still looks good. So do you have the right copyright law and oral storytelling? What is a copyright anyway? So a copyright is a legal protection and it applies to, and this is a quote, original works of authorship. And that means that it has to have some minimal level of creativity and it's created by an author, a person. Um, it includes all kinds of works. So you don't just have a copyright on books, you have a copyright on movies, dramatic works, um, music, lyrics, sculptures, all kinds of things. And copyright law, once you get your copyright, you basically have a monopoly from the United States government where you are the only one who is allowed to do a bundle of things with your work. Those rights are you get to copy the work, you get to distribute it, you get to publish it, you get to perform it, and you get to create what are called derivative works based on it. Derivative works are important because basically there's something that's not an exact copy. It's a new work or a new format of the original work. So that comes into play a lot when you're thinking about, you know, am I creating something new or is this really a derivative work of someone else's earlier story, which I'll come back to later. So although the second that something is in a tangible medium, it can be copyright protected. That means when you take your story and you write it down, or when you record it via Zoom, as I understand that you do for these meetings, you are fixing your work and you are entitled to copyright protection, but you have to register it with the copyright office before you can actually do anything about it in court. So that is, what is a copyright? Now, what is copyright infringement? Why, what is it? Why do we care? Why do we worry about it? What you guys are going to be worried about mostly is direct infringement, which is someone copied the work without permission. Now, as I said earlier, the work does not have to be identical. It just has to be substantially similar. So that means that when Disney comes out with a story full of characters, if you borrow those characters, if you borrow the plot, if you borrow substantially similar elements of it, but you've changed certain things, that doesn't get you away from copyright infringement. So it includes the production of derivative works. So similarly, if a story is in a book and you wanna make a musical, that's no good either. Even though obviously a lot of work and creativity is gonna go into that, it's still a derivative work of the original. And if you're at all a fan of Bridgerton, the TV show, you might've heard of the fact that an unauthorized musical came out that was very big on TikTok social media site. Essentially, they, the creators of the unauthorized musical had just been making, you know, fun stories, short clips, little musical sessions. The creators of Bridgerton didn't care for a long time. It was fan art. But then when they put it all together in a paid production musical, Netflix is now bringing down the hammer on them because that is an unauthorized derivative work. All right, something you might have heard of, which I love, it's very near and dear to my heart, but it's not exactly the shield you might think it is, is fair use. Fair use is how we take account of the First Amendment in copyright, because we have to have free speech, right? Like we should still be able to tell stories, explain facts, tell the news, and maybe even poke a little fun at other people's work. Um, and that all goes to the fair use defense. Something that's really critical to understand about fair use that most people don't, and even lawyers don't sometimes, is that it is a defense. When something is a defense, you've already committed the primary wrong. So you've, you're already a fringer, an infringer if you're arguing that it's fair use. Now, fair use can be a complete defense. And even in a court of law, the judge can decide, oh no, this is fair use. They're not liable for infringement. But you would have to convince the person that you're taking the material from not to sue you because it's fair use or a judge that it's fair use. And that is not as obvious as people think it is. Uh, first of all, even if you're the most persuasive person on the planet, it's a multi-factor test. None of the factors are dispositive. And all, so in the law, you have the law. It comes down from on high. It rules us all. But as far as what the law means, it's up to judges and courts and to interpret what that is. So 
we're going to look at these four factors, which I've listed here. You've got the purpose and character of the use, the nature of the work, the amount of the portion that you're using, and the effect of the use. But there's no perfect science to apply these. And they're going to turn out different in a lot of cases. And within most cases, you've got lawyers on both sides arguing, oh, no, it's not that way. It's this way. So for example, say I am telling a historical story that is significant and factual, but I have taken almost all of my content from a retelling of that story by someone else. Now, I may be presenting it in a classroom and not making any money off of it. So the purpose and character of the use is nonprofit educational. However, uh, and the nature of the original work is also going to be historical. However, the amount and substantiality of the portion used, because I'm going to be using the whole thing, is going to be against me. And the effect of the use on the potential market is kind of a wash. It could go both ways. I could give them more uh, publicity, or I could be convincing people to come see me present it instead of buying the original work. So these are themselves a legal language that has to be interpreted, and then it's a balancing test. But this is why a lot of times you'll hear fair use, especially in the context of education. Um, you know, it's education, it's reporting, it must be fair use, but that's only one factor. And for an example of how even things that are super historical and educational and important to the culture, uh, in the LA riots, there was footage of beatings by police officers going down. The footage itself was several hours. The news, different news agencies clipped one section, one 15 second section that was plastered all over the news. That went all the way up to the Ninth Circuit Court of Appeals, which means they had a trial, they had an appeal, they had an, another appeal. And even at the end of all the cases, they turned out differently depending on the specific situation, even though they were talking about the same piece of footage. So in many cases, the reporters ended up being protected by fair use because it was reporting, the original work was factual, the amount they used was small, though important. Um, but ultimately, it was still a fact question. That's the problem, is that you can't say something is fair use and then you have that right to sit on it. You've got to convince other people, most importantly, the copyright owner of the court, who is not going to have the same opinion as you of the value of what you're doing. One other phrase that comes up a lot that is a lot more of a safe bet for you storytellers is the public domain. So whereas fair use is a defense that comes in at kind of the last moment, the public domain means that it's not copyright protected in the first instance. So public domain works, they're not restricted by copyright. You do not need a license. You do not need to pay a fee. You have pretty much unrestricted creative options with public domain items. There's a few ways things can be in the public domain. I've listed them all here. Happy to provide these slides to anyone who wants them afterwards, who just really wants to become a copyright maven. The one we're most concerned about here is ones that enter the public domain over time because their copyright is expired. Uh, that's a lot of the source material people tend to draw on, but it's also possible that they're in the public domain because they were never, never copyrighted. So anything that's not copyrighted is public domain. There's just two universes here. There's copyrighted and there's public domain. Copyright, you have to contend with the owner. Public domain, you don't have to do anything but enjoy yourself. Just kidding. As far as copyright is concerned, you don't owe anyone anything to use it. Um, but basically it could also be because it was never copyrighted or some authors assign their works to the public domain out of a degree of being magnanimous and wanting people to work on them, which is a really cool thing to do. Um, so what works have entered the public domain is a math problem that could break your brain uh, because law changes over time, unfortunately, to the great dismay of all the law students I talk to, the law that applies today may not be the law that applies next year or even tomorrow, depending on how things work. Um, so one way that the law has changed over time is that our lovely legislature has come up with a bunch of different versions of the Copyright Act because they were trying to hit this magical sweet spot of the perfect amount of time before something enters the public domain. And they came up with a different answer depending on who was in the legislature and who was lobbying at that time. So what works are in the public domain? All published works between 1923. Yes. So that's great. That's good. But the important thing there is published. Uh, and that 
can create a wrinkle with historical material that isn't published until later. So just because something is old doesn't mean it was published on the original date that you're thinking of. A good example would be Anne Frank's diaries, which were certainly not published at the same time they were written. They were published later. Um, so I've put out factors here. Basically, you can see the windows of time where if things were published during a certain period with certain law applied, then they have their own copyright term. The way the law is now, so a good safe bet, relatively safe bet, is if it's published before 1923, you should be good to go. If it's after 1923 or if it was unpublished but created and registered, you might be in a different window. And honestly, you're best off consulting with an attorney or you're really, you know, pushing your legal skills here. Uh, so right now, if we were to file for copyrights right now, the state of the law is that you get the, your life plus 70 years, which is a long, long time, you can imagine. Uh, this means that copyrighted works created in like the 1970s are not probably going to be public domain during our lifetime. Um, and in general, works published after 1977 are not going to fall into public domain until 70 years after the death of the author and then an even a longer period of time for certain kinds of works. So basically, if your work is under 100 years old and your author is alive or deceased in the last 70 years, you potentially have a copyright problem because it's not going to be in the public domain unless they put it there. Um, all right. So now we have our terminology that we're working with. We have, we know what a copyright is. We know what the public domain is and what fair use is. How do these all come into play when we are devising and telling our stories? And I got a couple of examples and hopefully I haven't oversimplified them. I thought these were all good examples to frame as myths and explain why you might think that, but it isn't necessarily true. So my myth number one is if I change elements of someone else's story or present it in a new format, then I am not liable for copyright infringement. And I already tried to nip that one in the bud earlier by explaining derivative works. Derivative works are still protected. If I make a book, I have the right to make that into a musical later. If I write a memoir, I have the right to decide who's gonna do the spoken word renditions of that memoir. Um, and so that you could you can see how that would work, especially now with the predominance of audiobooks, for example, that just because you know authors are not going to authorize that, for lack of a better word, um, they have the right to do that. So similarly, just changing some elements of the story is not going to be enough if it's still substantially similar. That's the magic legalese language that lawyers can fight about all day to the underlying story. And lawyer, there have been a lot of cases arguing, you know, is this the expression? Is this the unique expression that we're protecting? Or are these the underlying facts and ideas? And that obviously gets really theoretical and goes all the way to the Supreme Court often. Well, not often, nothing goes to the Supreme Court often, but um, you know, it's so difficult to come to a consensus on what amount of similarity is too similar. And if you run into a very powerful copyright holder, for example, like a Disney, Disney is going to say everything is way too similar and you're not allowed to do it. On the other hand, there are more gratuitous copyright holders who are going to, you know, realize that there's a reasonable scope of telling of the same ideas and concepts and different expression. Um, so, for example, um, I would say, I would say, and most storytellers, I think, would say that Disney does not own the fundamental idea of a young lion coming to maturity and taking over his pride of lions. Disney can't own that idea. What Disney can have a copyright on is their presentation of that story in the film, how the characters are presented, the way that the story is lined up, all of the different pieces that put together to create impact, where if you try to create those same characters uh, in a very similar way, then it's still gonna give you, it's gonna, a knockoff, basically. When you see knockoff stories, that's what's kind of wrong about it in your head is that it's an it's substantially similar. It's still copying. Um, and you know, you will see knockoffs. You'll definitely see them. And sometimes they're bad and they're really far off, and it's not really worth it for Barbie to come for a knockoff story. But you know, sometimes they will come for them. Um, and as I said, especially with Disney. 
So the fact of this is that simply changing some elements or the format of someone else's story is not going to be good enough to make you immune to infringement liability. And liability means being dragged into court and being told that you're a bad person, not really, but you know, you owe money, you did this, you were wrong, you committed infringement. So as it says here, it does not need to be identical, just substantially similar. And we can argue about what that is. Um, and copyright owners have the exclusive right to make their derivative works, which is a new work that translates or transforms it into something else, which honestly we see a lot and it's, it's pretty cool. I love to see adaptations of things. Um, all right, so moving on to my next myth, we have a fairy tale or a fable or a story of that nature that's been retold in various forms by various storytellers. Surely I can retell that story without any consequences. No, um, if a story has previously been retold in various forms, that doesn't mean it's automatically public domain. There could be a few different things that are actually happening. First, it may be in the public domain. That may be an option, in which case you can retell it, but that's something you wanna investigate for yourself because you don't always know that someone else is doing the right thing. Um, and honestly, most of the time you can assume that they're not doing the right thing if it makes you be like, oh, that doesn't seem correct. Um, so if it's not the public domain, it could be that the other storytellers have a license to retell the story, which is basically a contract and it can be a little bare bones, but it's you getting the permission of the copyright holder to use it. So for a big production, licenses, licenses, licenses. They're almost not even thinking about the public domain. They're trying to get licenses for everything because they don't want to hear it from anyone later. For an individual, an individual creator getting licenses is a little more arduous. Um, and it's interesting because sometimes you will go to these, I've represented some smaller creators where they really want to license things, even though it's unlikely that they're ever going to get any scrutiny scrutiny because the amount that they're doing is so small and is probably fair use with all of the caveats I gave you. Um, but they want to license anyway. And sometimes like the licensor is too big to even notice you almost. Uh, so for example, and this is, I'll, I'll rein it back into oral storytelling, but you cannot license anything for the Olympics. Good luck, they will not do it. Nothing for commercial use and everything else very restrictive. So they may have a license to use it from the copyright holder back to the issue of a fairy tale or fable, but we can't be sure. So it may be in the public domain. They may be under a license where they have permission. Um, and third, they may be infringing copyrights. They may just be doing the wrong thing, assuming that fair use protects them. And by wrong, let's call it misled. The misled thing is assuming that you are completely safe and non-infringing and you can do whatever you want. So oftentimes with a fairy tale or fable, the underlying fairy tale or fable has entered into the public domain. However, when that is expressed in a new way that gives it a new life and a new story, so you know, The Little Mermaid is something I always bring up for this because it's clearly a fairy tale or fable and the original Grimm's is public domain. However, the Disney version is not public domain. So all of those things that make the Disney version a unique expression, the red hair, uh, flounder, Ursula's eels, like things that were not in the original Grimm, that's still protected. So oftentimes people will go, oh, the Little Mermaid, I can tell that story. You can tell the version that relies on the public domain version, but you should be cautious of incorporating other retellings into it. And you should be aware that people can claim their retellings as long as they have added that next level of expression that transforms the original. Um, and again, this is not a simple concept to get if it's confusing. Lawyers and judges and academic professionals have argued about this for years and years and years and years. Um, so, you know, what is in the public domain is a question of time. Um, and you should definitely be looking into the original fairy tale or fable and avoiding any of the elements that have been added by other people. All right, for my third myth versus fact, uh, if a story is historical and my source for my retelling is a historical document, then I am not liable for copyright infringement. And that is a myth because, again, just because something is historical doesn't mean it's public domain. You're going to have to look for the publication date. You're going to want to see where it falls in all the dates that I previously gave you. 
And you still want to be cautious because things that came out a long time ago can be published at a later date. So just because a story or source material is historical doesn't make it automatically fair use either because it's only going to be one or two of those factors in the four factor test. They're going to care that it's historical when they look at why you're using it. They're going to care that the source is historical, but that doesn't really change the impact on the underlying value of the good. And it doesn't really change how much of it you're using. So if uh, Anne Frank is a pretty easily accessible example, although I apologize if I already discussed this one, essentially you have a story that's old, that's factual, and it's not the fact that it happened, that she existed and that this happened to her is not copyrightable. That's just a fact, that's just an idea. The expression of the story itself as told through her diary was not published until much later. And I believe, although I should confirm this, I don't believe that her family's put it in the public domain or the publisher, if they have, caveat to all that I've said, that's that one unique situation. But um, you cannot, or you should not be able to go out and present the full diary yourself or even substantial portions of the diary yourself without asking for a license. Um, and that's because like I said, even if you're not taking all of it, if you take the biggest, most substantial portion and someone says, oh, that's substantially similar in a derivative work, it's still infringement. So the moral of the story is you're never safe. Just kidding. Most of the time um, you wanna look at the source of your material. See if it's in the public domain. If it's not in the public domain, is it worth getting a license to do a full rendition of that story based on you know the story being that good or what have you, or to risk not having a license not being public domain and it being fair use. Artists are notoriously risky. I advise some risky individuals and it's normal for human beings to have a range of risk adversity of things that they're comfortable with. So some people are not comfortable with any risk at all. They're gonna go for a license for everything. And that is the most lawyerly response that I can give you. But on the other end of the scale, some artists are like, no, this is my first amendment freedom of speech. Sue me, Disney. But they get into that position of being like, well, sue me, which is not ideal. And for me, I think that the best middle way between being off the wall artists and way, way risk adverse to the point where we don't feel like we can say anything is being really judicious about making sure that we are not just putting out something that is a retelling that's super similar in a new format. We wanna be creative. We want to do new things. We want to not borrow too much and incorporate a lot of other elements so that it's a new expression while still being wary that it can still be a derivative work. Um, basically, the more spin you can put on it, the safer you are. And you are not safe if you are just retelling, just retelling a story, um, unless it is in the public domain and in, in that case, have fun. But that's a tricky question. And one other thing that I wanted to bring up, although it may come up as a question, but it, it came up in our pre-talk, um, Creative Commons is a word you might've heard of before. It's actually a form of a license. So a license is the permission from the copyright holder to do whatever your intended use is. So there's different kinds of licenses. You know, I want the license to print this in a book. I want the license to perform this publicly. So Creative Commons is a type of license where it's very easy to understand and you shouldn't need a lawyer to look at it. And it will give you, uh, there's a code basically of how to interpret the licenses that will tell you everything you can do with it. And the authors and creators have put that material out there because they want people to use it in the Creative Commons uh, according to the type of Creative Commons license. So within Creative Commons, there's different types of licenses, but they're pretty easy to understand. They try to describe them in ways like there will be a money sign with a big no through it. And that means you can't use it for commercial use. So it's a lot more accessible. And if you are looking for source material, definitely start looking for th old things, things in the public domain and things that are available through Creative Commons because those are gonna be easier for you to license. And that is the end of my spiel, I believe. Um, and with that, I think I am passing it back over to your members for their testimonials.
Thank you, Paige. Thank you so much for that presentation. We're going to move on now to uh, testimonies of two SAC members. Uh, the first one is Larry, um, and he hails from the Contra Costa Storytellers. He's a trick, what do you say, trick roper? <laughs> he gets their attention when he does the looping tricks and captures somebody in his audience for fun, some kids, adults too. But So his passion is for historical stories, and he's had questions along the way about, um, you know, does he have permission to tell those stories? We're asking these more and more. So Larry, uh, you know, a long time ago before we knew too much about permissions, what were some of your struggles back then? Well, I uh, learned trick roping in 1990 and decided to perform as a cowboy. And um, I had performed for 10 years as a juggler before that, uh, full time, and mostly in schools and libraries. And uh, from performing in schools and, and libraries, I learned that, that they wanted performances that were about 45 minutes. And I had plenty of juggling skills for that. But for roping, I only had maybe 20 minutes at the most. So I figured storytelling, tales of the of the old west would help me fill out my 45 minutes and so i found two stories uh, one a uh, true tale uh, from a, an old book and the other one a tall tale which i made up there was a problem though um at the time when i found those stories when i uh, first told them i didn't know about copyright i didn't think about how it affected me. And uh, I had told, uh, I told that story many times before I wondered how does copyright affect me? And so I did a little research and um, I found that when I learned the story and started telling it, that book that I got it from was still covered by, pop protected by copyright. But by the time I found, found out about copyright law, it was in the public domain. So, um, uh, and the, the story um, that I got, I changed it. I um, added things and took away things, um, added character voice, um, a number of things. But I still wouldn't have known about the story unless I read the book. It was from that book. I still wouldn't have known anything about it. So um, I had to get copyright. Um, since that time, I've uh, found a number of stories from books, um, and I, um, I tell mostly true tales from the Old West, um, and I always check to see if I can get copyright. Quite often, the author holds the copyright, even if it says copyright by the publisher. Um, and some of the responses I've got from my requests are, uh, the best response was, you can use anything from my book for any oral presentation. The worst that I got is, you cannot use anything from my book for any purpose whatsoever. And somewhere in the middle, um, the author I contacted, I think she hadn't got a request like this before. So after checking with her publisher, she said that I should give her a one-time fee of $50 and cite her book every time I told the story. So um, I've continued asking for permission from copywriter material, and I'm preparing to send out some more uh, requests for permissions at this time. Thanks, Larry. Yeah, and we appreciate the, the sharing that you did in the last storyline about Right. Many of these experiences you've had. Yeah. So uh, Marion, Marion Ferrante is going to also give us a testimonial. Our fearless leader from Delta Word Weavers has had some experience along these lines too. So Marion, please. Well, in the early 1990s, I attended the National Storytelling Festival. That was when it was called National Association for the Preservation and Perpetuation of Storytelling. 
I heard wonderful storytellers, Donald Davis, Jay O'Callaghan, Ray Hicks, Jackie Torrance, and Elizabeth Ellis. But Elizabeth Ellis, she told a story that just touched my heart. I loved her story called Freckles and, no, Flowers and Freckle Cream. It was about when she was, a, she was 12 and how she, te she was teased for her freckles and that she hated having freckles and she need needed to get rid of them. So she sneaked an order from freck for freckle cream, cutting it out of her cousin's movie magazine. And the company said it was going to come in plain brown paper freckle coat. That, that phrase right there, that's from her story. Um, she throws in these jokes. And I, I bought the cassette of her story and uh, told it, or yeah, I listened to it frequently. But uh, continuing, Elizabeth, she went out to the, meet her mailman for three weeks before he had that package, that special package for her, because she could not have anybody in her family know that she was going to deal with her problem, you know, the freckles that she had. So the story, it's really, it's about her flaw, her embarrassment, a plan she tried to get rid of them, but it failed, and how her grandpa gave her wisdom to deal with it. Well, I bought the cassette tape, and I listened to that over and over and over so I could just get the pausing, the phrasing of it. And I played it over and over, and I memorized her telling well, I had to change some of the scenes, like she'd say, I went down to the holler. Well, first of all, I, I didn't even try the Southern accent, but some of her you know, vocabulary was not mine at all. So essentially that some of the scenes I needed to change so that I could tell it, just tell it. Um, Well, I told Freckle Cream at my library and to school classes, usually giving her credit when I remembered, and I was praised for telling a good story. But throughout the 1990s, I participated in a storytelling certificate program at Dominican College in San Rafael, California. And it was in these classes taught by Gay Ducey and Ruth Stoddard that I learned of ethics for storytelling. I took it to heart and I stopped telling freckle cream. I thought about freckle cream story and I asked myself at last, what is it that I like about that story so much? And over time, I figured it out. I too had a childhood flaw that I struggled with. That's why I identified with Elizabeth's story. So I took the time to write down my own story of how I was teased for being so short and how I dealt with it, how an adult steered me to challenge it and when as I got older. The adult gave me advice that I held on, well, not at first, but for life. Maybe 12 years or so ago, I was invited to a house gathering of tellers at Sally Holzman House. And we were encouraged to bring a story. And it was near the festival time, Elizabeth Ellis would be there. I decided to tell my new story. I fessed up to Elizabeth, put it out on the table about imitating her story years before. And then I told my own story called A Bit of Wisdom. Some of you have heard me tell that when my mom encouraged me to be an elementary yard girl that I didn't want to do because I was too short. Her wisdom, Marion, it's not what's on the outside, but it's what's on the inside that counts. When I finished telling Elizabeth Ellis, she told me I did it. I had a story well told. I was redeemed. <laughs> so we challenged ourselves from them and I paid more attention and uh, Sometimes I know, uh, like I know Nancy Schemmel, she's in Berkeley, and I wrote to her to get permission, and I, you know, I saved her email. This, this is in print now. I've got permission from Nancy Schemmel to tell her stories because I love them. There's a, 
told and tell stories and young fun stories, but I've got permission from her to tell the ones that she has made. So I've got that. I've tried, I've written to two publishers of stories I really like to tell. And so we'll ask uh, yeah, Paige to deal with this. What have you written to the publishers? And there's no answer. And we know sometimes publishers, they change over many years from when I, I'm getting the name out of the book. I have probably an old address. I don't know what to do. So we storytellers struggle and I did, but I hope I'm getting better. Thank you. Thanks, Marion. And probably, Paige, that's the first question. Yes, although I will know I do have the chat pulled up and they're really good questions and I'm excited to deal with them. Um, okay, so first of all, it is, like I said, the safest course and by that sense, the best course to try to get a license for what you want to use. A lot of people, I'm, you know, happy and unhappy that the testimonials reflected what my experience has been, which is that people are really different over what they're gonna allow about the use of their art and how protective that they wanna be about that. So if you are trying to license it and you do not get permission, it's not the same thing as having a license. It is one thing that they will consider under a fair use defense, whether there is an accessible licensing scheme to license it because if there's no way to license it it doesn't really seem fair or like it's free speech if there's no way for you to actually use that of course it's still within people's rights always to say no or to not respond but as much as i want to re-impress that fair use is not an absolute shield that will protect you all the time um the factors are important because those are some things you can think of when you're like am i doing everything i can to make this as fair as possible which is also going to make me unlikely to get harshly targeted by the copyright owner. And one of those things is definitely asking for permission. So asking for permission and getting no response, um, somewhere in between getting a hard no and a yes, uh, you might reach out again. You might try to find a different way to use it or different material, get creative. But ultimately, you are more likely to be excused by a court for using it if there's no way for you to reasonably license it. So if that makes you feel any better, you were doing the right thing. There's no uh, legal recourse to make a publisher respond to you. And definitely it's uh, hitting a moving target, trying to figure out who even owns the underlying intellectual property there. Okay. Um, hopefully that answered your question, although it's a little bit unsatisfying. You, you can't make the publisher answer you, but by asking, you've done, you've done a good step. Um, so the first question I saw that popped up that got me so excited from Brandon Spars, just to call you out, uh, Disney stole the Lion King from the Japanese animated film Kimba the White Lion. I knew exactly what you were talking about when you said it, and just to be a little... So this is a visual that I actually use when I'm teaching this to college students about how like basically the difference between an idea and an expression. So what I'm showing on the screen right now is a side by side, two frames. The white one is from Kimba the White Lion. The other one is from the Lion King. So we have literally the same visual. And this is, oh, I hope I can pull up more, but I think it'll only let me show one at a time. Um, so there's all kinds of examples from this film of Lion King doing that. Here's another one where basically, I mean, you can't own the idea. So the way that this will get your brain a little mixed up is that Disney, I believe, is infringing on the copyright of Kimba the White Lion. Nobody cares. Nobody cares because this little Japanese animation company didn't stand up to Disney it just is the way it is now. Disney owns Lion King. The Japanese company never, they either, it wasn't worth the risk analysis to them because Disney is so powerful that like ownership of this property, you know, would have been a huge legal battle. So the Japanese animation company was just like, you know what? Whatever, we won't release it in the US. Um, and it is the way it is. But to the person who brought up Kim of the White Lion, you are absolutely right. Lion King is stolen. Um, and I would say that there can definitely be multiple stories that exist about a young lion coming back to seize power, even maybe from his uncle, because that might be, a, that would be, that would make sense in the Lion Kingdom, right? Like lion, lion politics isn't copyrighted by Disney. But when you start copying the expression, the story itself, the characters, the way they fit together, the way it looks, 
is when you are doing copyright infringement, but Disney gets away with a lot of stuff um, that the rest of us wouldn't. All right, speaking of the stuff that Disney gets away with, uh, the next question was also about Disney, which I'm just laughing at because sometimes I really take a target at Disney because they're easy to talk about, but they it does make people confused because they're like, wait, Disney can't own that. And it's like, you're right. They can't, but they do because they're Disney. So the next question was, how about the hundreds of versions of Cinderella throughout the world? Surely Disney doesn't own it. You are right. The underlying story of Cinderella, the fairy tale has entered the public domain. What Disney owns is Disney's expression of that underlying story through, and if you think about some of the examples I just showed you from The Lion King, the characters, the character design, the way the scenes fit together, I'm fairly certain, although I'm not sure now, I'm like, were there mice that sewed things in the original Cinderella? I'm not sure about that. Um, those are the things that Disney would try to protect. And certainly their character designs in them and of themselves are artwork. Um, so you are right, Cinderella can be retold. Just make sure that you are doing a retelling that is based on a public domain, older, fairy tale version and not one of the modern interpretations of Cinderella and, you know, taking the specifics from those that were their creative edition. All right. Um, to leave Disney alone for just a moment, is it a myth that when used for nonprofit and educational purposes, you are safe? That's a great question in the lines of my other myths, because it is a myth. You're not always safe when you're using something for nonprofit and educational reasons. And this is because in the big scope of copyright, you've got your copyright infringement. If it's public domain, there's no infringement, no issue of infringement. If it's fair use, there's infringement and we're, we're asking another question, which is what is, if the defense applies? So if something is being used for nonprofit and educational purposes, that goes under the first factor of the fair use analysis, which is the nature of the nature of the use basically. And it is definitely heavily weighed by courts so oftentimes things that are nonprofit and educational, they have the benefit of one, the type of the use and the nature of the use is gonna favor the person who's using it. And two, the effect on the market is gonna favor the person that's using it. So when you have a nonprofit educational use, you're kind of already got two of the four factors in your favor and you're on a lot safer ground, which is why um, when I'm teaching the subject, I, I go a little loose with the copyright because among educators, which I, I do teach sometimes at actual classrooms, so I count myself among them, uh, there's a lot more borrowing and, and certain nonprofits are happy that you share their guidance with other people, for example. Um, but it is, it is a myth that that's automatically going to be safe just because you're not making money and just because it's for educational purposes. Um, because you can imagine a situation where you're not making any money, but you're certainly helping hurting someone else's pocketbook. So if you just make something available for free online, it's nonprofit, but it's certainly under that factor of it's going to hurt the market for the original, which is something that courts care about. Because the point is, is that we don't want to make everything so easy to use that no one has any incentive to make new things, which, you know, is a tricky line to walk because it works both ways. All right, another excellent question. What about from indigenous people? And I, first of all, I'm not an indigenous person. So speaking from my place of privilege, this is definitely, it's an issue. It's unfortunately one of those things that is oftentimes an ethical issue rather than a legal issue um, because they're passed down, for things passed down via the oral tradition, the problem from a copyright law standpoint is they're never published. They're never like recorded until you put them in a book, until you record the speaker, which in that case, it's just kind of perverse, right? That I can record an indigenous person taking the story and now we're co-creators of a copyrighted work. So that, it definitely creates a wrinkle where I think that me, I think there should be more of an ethical boundary of acknowledging where it came from and probably, you know, deferring to, if you have anyone indigenous, you can talk to about it and make sure that you are telling it in a way that is culturally sensitive. 
um, and not appropriation. That's more of an ethical issue. The unfortunate thing is that because they are very old and because they might have never been published, they probably don't own a copyright in the traditional sense to them unless they have gone through a, unless the tribe or later descendants have made an effort to, uh, for example, anthologize it in paper. Um, I'm thinking right now, I've got this great book back here somewhere called um, Braiding Sweetgrass that is an anthology that has a bunch of different Native American myths about botany and it's just a great book but definitely it's it comes to mind because I think certainly now the creator being indigenous has the copyright in her work she's certainly borrowed from a lot of indigenous traditions and did so in a respectful way I don't really think she needed to ask for copyright permission for a lot of those things but it's more of an ethical issue than a copyright issue because unfortunately for spoken word um, there's many ways for it to fall through the cracks where the story ends up being owned by people who shouldn't own it or it shouldn't be owned at all. Um, sorry, I could go, we could go way far abroad on like the, uh, the ethics of art and the law, but I don't want to take too much time. Let me see. Okay. Uh, when you mention a license, what kind of license, how do you obtain the license? So that is me running away with my legalese words that are significant, but not used. So a license is a contract that allows you to do something. It's not like a driver's license. It's a piece of paper that says, I copyright owner give permission to this storyteller to do an oral recorded retelling of my story for profit, you know on this streaming platform. So it's basically a contract. Um, and some, to get a license, you reach out to the copyright holder and ask, can I have a license to use it? You say, what for? Uh, sometimes it'll be really brief. Uh, sometimes it will be an actual formal contract. Ideally, and actually not just ideally, legally you want something in writing that specifies who you are, who the copyright owner is, who, what the work is and what you're allowed to do with it. Um, so those are kind of the four necessary components of a license, although certainly licenses can be long, complicated legal documents. Uh, Creative Commons licenses, which I mentioned before, are an example of a short, shorter, easily understandable licensing scheme. Um, okay, next up. Can you talk at all about using music in your storytelling class or free story distribution? So music is copyrighted just like the story. Um, it's going to have the same sort of analysis that goes into it, which is, is the music in the public domain? Probably not, just because methods of recording are relatively new. Uh, furthermore, just to complicate things, music actually has two copyrights. You can copyright the musical score, like the underlying written, or three pieces. You can copyright the written music, you can copyright the lyrics, and then you can copyright the recorded songs. You have three different copyrights, uh, unlikely to be in the public domain, except for maybe the original music and lyrics to some older songs. Um, and if you're playing music, you're probably going to be playing the whole thing, which means that under fair use, you've already got a bit of a dark mark against you by using the whole thing. Although, as I said, counterbalancing that you're doing it for nonprofit purposes, essentially, I would def I would advise against it strongly. Um, but there are also a lot of musical sources that are easily licensed online. Um, and I would look again to the Creative Commons system um, or music publishers asking about it. There's also now that there's a lot more online content there. And I can't think of any of them right now, but I do know that services exist that basically create music to be used for this purpose for relatively cheap licensing fees. So for music, it's a risky proposition because it's likely to be protected. You're likely to use the whole thing. So even if it's free, better to ask permission. Um, all right, next up, can you use someone's real name first only in a story without their permission? So there is a whole, names can't, for copyright purposes, you're fine. There's other laws that come into play called the right of publicity, and there's also defamation laws that come into play. So as long as it's the truth, the truth is a defense to defamation. But as you now know, having heard from me, defenses aren't coming into play until we're all in front of a judge arguing. So that's not the best scenario for you. Um, and then if, if they have a right to publicity, basically, you can't use it in a way that makes it seem like they're endorsing your story uh, or uh, promoting your story. So it can't seem like they're endorsing your story. It can't be untrue. And, um, and 
unfortunately, if those are your defenses, uh, you'll have to prove that to the other party or in the court of law because it's not going to be an easy out. So you can, you totally can. Just make sure you're factually accurate and you're not creating any misapprehension about their involvement and be prepared to defend yourself if that someone happens to be litigious and not litigious, meaning they like to sue people. All right. Uh, what if, sorry, I'm, I'm running a little fast. Uh, what if the copyright of the original is expired, but another publisher has reprinted and copyrighted their reprinting? So that is, um, that is kind of the issue. That is how people extend their ownerships for longer periods of time by reprinting new editions with slightly different changes. So they can print a new edition and like add a, editor's statement at the beginning. So um, you are still going to have to contend with the reprinting. Um, probably someone who does that is pretty sophisticated. So you'd wanna be a little bit worried about them that you wanna deal with them legally um, just because that that is something of someone who's trying to expand their rights. You know what I said? Um, okay. It's been said you need permission from a tribe to tell their stories. Yes, you are right. Copyrights don't play here. Yeah. Um, okay, piggybacking on Larry's question, suppose many publishers have reprinted the original stories and copyrighted them. Why would a person need to get permission to record or perform those stories? The original author, dead over 100 years, wrote his own version of folk tales in the culture. All the republished works are the original works, no changes. Okay, then you should be fine. Should be, again, remember... <laughs> Disney, people can be unreasonable. People with a lot of money can be big bullies, but I think you're correct. So in that case, you've got something that's moved into the public domain. Many different publishers have republished it. No one's really adding something new. You should be able to retell the original. Um, but publishing new editions is how people try to expand the life of their natural copyright. But if people are republishing it for like, Again, I brought up Little Mermaid. It's a good example because it's, it's got a lot of different versions in a lot of different places that obviously coexist just fine. Yeah, without everyone. Excuse me. They're really, uh, I'm interested in recording. And the thing is, I've already heard recorded versions and I know I can do a better job. And, you know, mm -hmm. the person is just hired as a narrator. And again, believe me, there's lots of publishing of the same works and no mm -hmm. changes are done, you know, but I, you get nervous because of the whole legal yeah. thing. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. You think it might be okay. Okay. I, I would be, be sure that it's in the public domain first. Well, Just no. be sure. How, how could it be in the public domain if other people are republishing the same? Oh. Well, I can publish, for example, I'm pretty sure the Bible's in the public domain at this point, and I can keep, I can publish that. Um, oh. Although now I'm like, let's see, King James Bible. I don't know. That's a, that's an addition, right? Um, someone else is retelling. Hmm. So I should really look up these individual stories and see if I find them. Well, just because they're online doesn't mean they're in the public domain. I mean, how do you, right. how do you, so you should see verify? The age. Go ahead. Sure. Uh, it's difficult to do. It is a complicated legal question. Generally, you want to look at the date of publication and the original. Yeah. Well, mm -hmm. the original, yes, of the original, um, if it has been reprinted exactly by other people yes, who have their has. own copyrighted version of it, right. that's its own, that's a separate kind of copyrighted where it's a derivative work based on a public domain and they've just added something to it. Um, so you should be fine. I would just be cautious that that's actually what's happening instead of a situation where it's like the original publisher or writer is trying to extend the life. Yeah, I don't copyright. think so, but okay. Okay, thank you. Um, sure. And, oh, I was going to say, and I think, so it's on the slide I sent out, but I didn't click through to it in real life. Uh, the U.S. Copyright Office, the government agency, has a surprisingly helpful website where you can search copyrighted works and you can register your own copyrighted works if you guys are ultimately interested in registering your stories and protecting them. You would need to uh, basically get them fixed in a tangible medium, so either written down or recorded, and then you could register them. And you can also search other people's registered works, figure out who the copyright holder is so that you're talking to the right person. And it has other uh, kind of like guidance. So that's just um, it's uscopyrightoffice.gov. Let's see. Yeah. And it's on the slides. And I think that's all my questions from the chat. I'm wow. going to type this in. 
but um, referring to the reprinting and recopywriting, mm -hmm. if you read the original version, um, can you still use it without copyright infringement? Yes, if the original version has moved into the public domain, it was published before 1923, um, then the, re the republications, the way they've done it, their intros and whatever are their own copyrighted work, but the original that's passed into the public domain is still safe oh. to use. Um, okay, thank you. Sure. Thank you, Paige. Wow, that's, I think you covered a lot of ground. I really, really, we all really appreciate it. And we'll be probably contacting you for other questions. Yeah, yeah, no worries. Um, it's a lot of content. It is definitely, it's a little nerve wracking because where is the safety here? But hopefully it was helpful to you guys to give you some guidance going forward. Gave us a lot to think to about, here. for sure, for sure. Marion, did you want to close and invite people for your, your after party. <laughs> a few announcements first that uh, SAC has its ongoing genre stories coming. So every month um, uh, you need to apply if you'd like to be a storyteller under a theme. So go to the website, Storytelling Association of California, look up genre tales to see what the coming uh, topics are. October is spooky stories. They're, they're not doing uh, November because it's celebration. December will be sacred and inspirational stories and January is tall tales. Beyond that, please go to the Storytelling Association and then ask your, uh, your local story swap leader that you would be their representative to tell for that particular month. So it's been a wonderful series on behalf of SAC. Thank you so much. Celebration is coming up and there are um, three or four events. We're still, uh, some swaps are getting together. On November 8th, the Do Tell Story Swap has their celebration. November 13th, Delta Word Weavers is with Mixed Bag plus community storytellers from Southern California. So the three of us are getting together. Uh, we're gonna have something new for our celebration, but uh, we're still planning it before we let the uh, idea out of the bag, but it's going to be very fun, our celebration. November 20th is the Sacramento Storytelling Guild and Inland Valley from Southern California. So we uh, devised getting together to get more acquainted with Southern California and Northern because we are storytelling of California. Are there any more events personal that somebody has coming up? I, I can't see everybody in the, I don't see any hands raised. <laughs> okay. I, Claire, I got Claire, hands. Claire. 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 <laughs> okay. I, um, I'm telling this week at a, uh, well, let's see, is it a slam or a swap? I think it's a slam six feet apart productions on Wednesday yes. night, the Wednesday, the 14th at six o'clock. Um, the Where theme do we is look for um, the details of it. What's that? Where do we look for details of that? I will uh, send it in the uh, chatty thing. Okay. Um, let's see. I'll just find the link. Okay, seeing no more hands raised. All right, somebody wants my email address. All right. So thank you one and all for coming. You can stay after we stop the recording here briefly uh, to chat if you'd like. But we're going to sign up on our video people. So thank you all for coming and see you uh, in October for uh, swap groups and uh, genre tales. See you.